today the Atlantic Council um, held an Army Futures Forum. The presenters were a mixture of senior uh, U.S. Army leaders, um, some various defense intellectuals and defense officials, and some sci um, science fiction writers and some academics. Um, I'm going to go over some notes that uh, that are in no particular order, um, not really organized, not organized at all. Um, so I'm just going to hit some notes. Um, they are they are short, crisp, and um, well, they are what they are. All right. Um, obviously, n I will attribute none of, none of this to any per, uh, individuals or yeah, any individuals. So senior army leaders need to think about the future, uh, and thinking about the future for senior army leaders involves uh, making making that future. Um, there are there are two um, major themes that that together make up a powerful theme about the changing character of war, and this is re the return of great power conflict, and robots, uh, robotics, and autonomous systems. So together, a major uh, dynamic in the changing character of war. Um, there, uh, there's, these were several opening themes. There's another theme about um, the U.S. military's um, uh, unimpressive record uh, of um, latching on to optimistic visions of quick and decisive first strikes followed by short wars, short conflicts. Technology and national industrial base senior army leaders need to uh, pay attention to not just emerging and changing technology but um, the, the health and character and direction of, the, of change in the national industrial base. Senior army leader, leaders need to think and employ foresight in order to avoid pitfalls and lessons and to uh, incorporate lessons from the past. So to drill down again, we're talking about missed opportunities, uh, missing the, the signals of important changes to the character of war. This means missing weak and strong signals about changes uh, to both warfare and in the operating envir operational environment. Uh, and the implications for future war fighting. Um, theme, failure to anticipate. Um, <laughs> this is pretty strong. Ukraine, the r recent Russian experience in Ukraine is a harbinger of future warfare in some way. Um, fourth, in What's called, what has been called the Fourth Industrial Revolution um, is um, set to set in motion change as fundamental as the changes around the turn of the 20th century. Um, we are looking at pro profound change in the, again, character of war, uh, certainly within, certainly within the next generation. Um, and there is a deep need for, again, senior army and other service leaders to anticipate and see upcoming problems and challenges. There is a a deep and troubling divide in the in U.S. Uh, society between uh, those um, who are tasked or entrusted with solving broad problems, call them the elites, call them what you want, um, and the rest of the population. Meaning that the idea here is that those who are entrusted with putting forth answers and plans of action to tackle major social problems. They are insulated and isolated. They, uh, of course this is not an us them thing, but um, so for national security, national security policy uh, influencers are too insulated too isolated from the rest of society 
they display an arrogance um, an arrogance uh, born from their self sense of expertise um, and change in the world today is too much for any um, ex expert to not um, continue learning uh, and there's also a lack of passion there is a, a lack of passion among national security influencers about future challenges what needs to be done um, this these things might sound um, a bit di disconnected the way I'm presenting them but within the context of the conference it was if national security influencers don't get some things right enough about the next war the next first battle of the next war um, obviously major defeats and major loss of life is is the price is the price that's going to be paid um, and unnecessary at that um, we now have um, unlike earlier times we have the tools and ability to start um, realizing trackable foresight uh, of course using computers and, and uh, big data analysis etc we have the ability we're just now starting to get a realistic ability um, for trackable foresight so uh, basically tracking our predictions about the future um, in a much more up-to-date way which can allow for course corrections for organizations to be foresight uh, forward or foresight uh, based forward leaning uh, they need uh, new tools and new approaches uh, and tools and approaches that are not normally associated with big organizations. Uh, related to this is um, key leaders need to identify what are the bottlenecks that keep large organizations, of course I'm talking throughout here I guess unless I specify otherwise I'm talking about the national security um, establishment. So large organizations, what bottlenecks keep large organizations from exploiting foresight specifically from acting on an understanding of, of the future um, deep learning um, so so in part we're talking about um, um, programming computers that are able to learn uh, from massive data sets um, and in some way as we move into the future here there's a growing interconnectedness between uh, the cyber sp or cyberspace the physical world social media there's a big uh, difference between being able to see the future versus actually doing something about it um, there are case studies of large corporations or government entities um, actually seeing a fairly accurate picture of the future and yet still not acting on it. Um, there is a growing need right now to build um, data sets as needed if they're not available. The, the idea here is especially in national security in order to get to this, uh, to, in order to exploit this data analysis um, in the national security realm, we may need to um, create our own da data sets. Um, and uh, yeah, so there is another theme about uh, the Army future, future of the Army. And that is, um, and this is of necessity vague, but looking at the Army as a, 
is also a kind of society. Um, we have uh, myths, pretty deep, uh, deep-seated myths, and these deep-seated myths um, help create and shape the stories that the society. Um, and again, I'm talking about the army as a society, but similarly for the wider society, um, stories that we use to make sense of what's going on and certainly make sense of what's happened certainly in the recent past um, and that that so from myth to storytelling and storytelling to understanding of history so our understanding of history is maybe in some ways an application of of the stories we tell ourselves applied to our memory of the past and then it's a big step from that understanding of history and thinking about it it's a big jump but there's still a link between how we understand the the history with how we think about the future so to reiterate there's a big and important difference between predicting the future versus understanding the future Um, the nature of bureaucracies and the um, independent actions of future enemies means that advancements um, that advancements um, and we're talking here mainly technological so technological advancements in the military generally move in generations not in a like a continuous stream of of change whether speeding up or slowing down so again the nature of bureaucracies and the nature of in, of independent enemy action strongly influences this this generational advancement in technology and capabilities um, When uh, looking at the future and trying to, you know, predict where the army will go in the next five, ten, twenty years, it is just as bad. Uh, there's a problem, um, or I should say, the problem of early lock, especially on technology, is as bad and in some cases worse than the problem of uh, late lock. Uh, what is what does this mean? This means. Um, the example of the uh, um, the German the Messer uh, the Messerschmitt German uh, fighter World War II um, was was top in its class, but top in its class too early, uh, so that by the time Germany was fighting its critical air battles, the Messerschmitt had been passed up and then the Mi 262 German jet fighter was uh, was an example of late lock um, it was a uh, you know, substantial leap ahead in capability but simply too late to make a difference um, this is probably a big one for the army so the march to Baghdad in 2003 the march to Baghdad allowed uh, the US Army to br breathe a sigh of relief and say that uh, the heavy force will be saved and it was saved so the march to Baghdad saved saved the fate of the heavy force and uh, by some people's account, by the account of some, you know, uh, army uh, senior leaders, uh, that was a huge mistake. That was a huge mistake. Um, worldwide, worldwide, since you know, since the end of the Cold War and since 2000, there's actually been a sizable diminution of heavy armies, and this is something that that the U.S. 
army has preferred to not notice. <laughs> um, so in visioning the evolving character of warfare, um, has fundamentally to do with the vision, uh, not working with or tinkering with technologies. Um, all the tinkering with technologies uh, will be wasted if it doesn't serve a, a wider vision of a future warfare. Um, so future gazing, uh, as it was called by a senior retired army speaker, uh, needs to be highly disciplined, it must be holistic, and it must be structured by an understanding of the character of war, not technology. So basically looking at the future of warfare should not be looked at through the lens of technology. Um, and then there's been a, um, for some senior army leaders and army joint leaders, I mean senior joint leaders and senior army leaders, there's been a significant um, compression of the tactical and strategic levels of war and what are the uh, what are the implications of that? Um, when we're looking at the future of the army, um, for some for some observers, there's a uh, lack of uh, useful concepts of operation uh, for dealing with future threats. Technology counts, but it's hard to say what technology will count the most. And and now's a good time to uh, refer to my image I chose here. Of course, the ma massive technological change and many mess, many missed uh, observations. A lot of a lot of misunderstanding. misunderstanding in this uh, time period shown by the image here. Another way to look at the future of warfare and how things might be changing is what, uh, so I'm going to list um, four themes here and looking at future war and the future of the army. The idea is what do, what do changes to these four fundamental themes say about future war in the future army. So we have a fighters versus hiders. These are themes or dynamics that go throughout the, the history of warfare. There are times when fighters have the upper hand and there are times when hiders have the upper hand. Um, so one idea here is if if you believe in future warfare is going to be um, the all-seeing eye, then hiders are going to be at a serious disadvantage. That's an example. Then you have strikers versus shielders. You have protection versus access, which is pretty interesting. And then you have escalation versus de-escalation. So four fundamental themes or dynamics. You can use these to look at past warfare and you can use these to look at where, where we may be going, where we, where we may be headed. Um, foreshadowing and uh, recognizing change, recognizing um, plausible futures. Um, Concepts drive technology, and technology drive concepts. Um, the ideas matter as much as the technology. Um, thinking about future of warfare is important because of the costs of taking no action on signals that are out there, meaning signals for where we are headed. So a signal might be Russian use of social media, for example. Uh, 
uh, on the idea of recognizing changes and recognizing plausible futures. Part of it is cultural. So, um, so uh, a culture like the army, can the culture handle um, maybe a, what's called for in signals of the changing character of warfare? Um, is the political culture right? Is the budget environment right? Um, so to use an example, since there seems to have been a resurgence in interest in air land battle and how air land battle might be updated to the future. Once air land battle had taken hold um, after 1982, um, concept developers took um, a new project to chief of staff of the army called air land battle 2000. Um, it was well received by senior army leaders, but they also decided that it was too much for the army at that time. The army was going through major changes absorbing both air land battle as doctrine and the uh, so-called big five uh, weapon systems, and senior army leaders said, decided that uh, while air land battle 2000 as a concept was on track, it was uh, not realistically uh, able to be uh, acted on at that time. FCS, Future Combat System, uh, was an idea ahead of its time, killed by the Army after uh, General Shinseki left as Chief of Staff of the Army. We are, uh, the Army is currently uh, facing three compounding uh, horizons, no, yeah, three compounding horizons with respect to future challenges and threats. We have a current horizon, which is the various violent extremist groups that, that will be, uh, that will have to be dealt with for quite some time. Then we have the near horizon, uh, which is Russia. Um, probably don't need to say much more about that at this time. And then we have the far horizon, which is China. We will continue to need, uh, the Army will continue to need to project power into um, anti-access area denial environments. Um, in the near term, the Army is prioritizing uh, the Big Six. I won't go through the big six, big six, but they include, I'll give three examples. There's soldier lethality, there's a future vertical lift, and there's um, a new um, network. Um, but more importantly, um, the prioritization of the Big Six right now uh, is looking, is driving new looks at ways to realize the fundamentals. So shoot, move, communicate, protect, and sustain. Um, how are these things going to change? How are these things going to be done different? How are they going to be thought of differently in the future? Um, where we are right now for the Army is that we are, stand, we are on the top of an S-curve. Uh, we stand on top of a century, 100 years of optimizing mechanized and industrial warfare and that suggests major major changes for the future um, it's hard to say um, exactly where we are in the changing character warfare other than to say that we have, there are signals out there and these signals are coming at us uh, suggesting uh, we're on a cusp of a change in warfare, character of warfare. And it's, it's essential for senior army leaders to understand this brewing change uh, because decisions made today are shaping the future uh, force. So again to 
use historical examples? Um, do we do we understand to use a historical analogy? Do we understand the need for tank forces and mechanized infantry forces to fight with those tanks? Or do we think that uh, tanks are going to be uh, supporting infantry? The Army right now um, has been and continues to be consumed by current threats, current um, adversaries. And that, that has a lot to do with where the Army finds itself today. That's the reference there. Uh, where the Army finds itself budget-wise, where the Army finds itself R&D-wise. Army Futures uh, Studies should be based on a deep understanding of the industrial base. This is probably something that has atrophied. This is probably something that we don't understand well. Um, and this underscores the need to understand how R&D and basic science research moves to technology and technology to future capabilities to a future force.